Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the small town of Zama City in northwestern Alberta, Canada. Zama City is billed as a hamlet and is said to be Alberta's northernmost city. The last census there said 52 residents called it home, and the population trends down negative 29%. The oil and gas industries are the main employers here, and with everything becoming more mechanized and automated, the human populations in the area are in a steep decline. The area around Zama City is woodland and wetlands primarily, and is home to the threatened wood bison herd, as well as deer, moose, and woodland caribou herds. The First Nations tribe, called the Dene Ta, has long-running ties back to the land and, and find themselves in power struggles with the government and corporations over resources there. It turns out politicians and corporate opportunists aren't the only predators here, as it is also home for coyotes, foxes, and black bears. It is in this beautiful setting that our episode takes place today. At a remote drilling site operated by Cantex Drilling and Exploration Corporation, it was a normal day of dangerous and difficult work for the 30 workers there. The site was located about 40 kilometers, or 25 freedom units, if you're from the U.S., northwest of Zama City. 44-year-old Lee Randall Morris was a geologist at the remote drilling site and originally hailed from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. At around 4.45 p.m., Lee decided to take a walk and headed down toward the creek a few hundred yards from the drilling site camp. By dinner time at 5.30 p.m., he had not returned and no one had heard from him since he'd left a short while ago. The residents and employees of the camp had been warned not to leave the area alone. There are many dangerous animals nearby and without help, you can end up in a situation that can be deadly or you can just get lost in the thick woods surrounding the camp. 24-year-old Carol Marshall worked at the drilling site as a general laborer. She originally hailed from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and had relocated here for work. One of Carol's work associates, 21-year-old Martin Ellis, ran some heavy machinery at the drilling site. According to the sources I found, the two young people were at least friends and possibly romantic interests of each other. At around 7.30 p.m., Carol and Martin decided to go for a walk and smoke some after-dinner cigarettes together near the same creek that Morris had headed toward earlier that evening. As they neared the dense vegetation along the creek, a large black bear suddenly appeared only about 15 feet away. Carol and Martin immediately panicked and ran away as fast as they could while Martin headed toward the first tree he could find to climb. As he pulled himself up into the canopy of the tree, Martin's attention was on climbing and he lost sight of Carol and the bear. When he finally got to a precarious perch, he looked around and saw the bear mauling Carol. For several minutes, he watched it bite and claw his friend and could do nothing about it. When Carol stopped moving, the bear seemed to shift its interest. It glanced up the tree only a few yards away toward Martin. It slowly lumbered to the base of the tree Martin was sheltering in. It seemed to be mulling over the effort required to climb the tree and pull Martin from its limbs. About 80 yards back toward the camp, Martin saw a flash of motion in the bushes. He watched incredulously as the son of the camp foreman, Bud Whiting, came bounding into view. Martin yelled at the Whiting boy to leave and go get help. He warned him there was a black bear beneath the tree he was in, and that it had killed Carol. The Whiting boy dashed back into the brush to get help. A few short minutes later, Bud Whiting arrived at the location with his son and his rifle. Bud got to within shooting range and fired at the black bear. His shot wasn't immediately fatal, but it drove the bear off, allowing Martin to climb down. A few of the people from the camp came down to where Carol's body was lying. They began to look around and see how to best retrieve her body. They could see a large patch of disturbed soil about three or four yards from her body. As they investigated closer, they could see the body of Lee Randall Morris, buried underneath dirt and sticks scraped from nearby. It was clear the black bear was claiming Mr. Morris's body as his food cache, and had cached him for later consumption. The news of the predatory black bear attack was immediately relayed to the game management office, as well as the fatal attack details. They sent out a cohort of officers to locate the now injured black bear and dispatch it. They searched for the bear and found it toward midday the following afternoon. They promptly shot and killed it after confirming it was the same bear wounded at the site by Mr. Whiting's errant bullet. Martin wasn't injured, but was so stressed out by the events that he was taken to the nearby town of High Level 
to relax and recover from the shock of the events he'd just experienced. Lee and Carol's bodies were recovered, as well as their loved ones notified of their deaths. Their bodies were transported back to their families for memorial service. I could find no source indicating the health or condition of the bear. Nothing I read stated anything about cubs being present, nor a food cache other than Mr. Morris's remains being found nearby. It wasn't reported to be in ill health, nor gaunt, or underweight. This attack was a clear and simple case of a purely predatory attack by an otherwise healthy black bear on human beings. Granted that this black bear had killed Lee Randall Morris and cached his body for consumption, it is easy to understand the predatory motives behind his death. But to continue to stalk and kill additional parties is an extremely rare occurrence by any predator. It may be assumed that Carol and Martin happened to walk right upon the bare food cache of Mr. Morris's body, so it acted in defense of its food cache, and that is within the range of expected behavior of nearly any kind of bear. But to kill Carol, then wait for Martin to come down from the tree, communicates a very deliberate and intentional focus on killing more people for consumption. Currently, black bears can be found in over 75% of Alberta, with a total black bear population of 36,000 which puts black bear density at over 80 bears per 1,000 square kilometers. Black bear territory and grizzly territory roughly divide the province in half, with grizzlies making the western half of the territory their home and black bear the eastern half. This puts Zama City well within the grizzly bear territory and well outside of the established black bear territory, designated by the government of Alberta Wildlife Ministry. Fatal black bear attacks are rare, but black bear attacks with multiple fatalities are extremely rare and seem to happen most in Canada. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think the original attack on Lee Morris was a predatory attack? Do you think the subsequent attack on Carol was predatory or defensive? Why do you think the bear waited for Martin to come down from the tree? Do you think that living in grizzly territory drove the black bear into human predation? Given the dense brush in the area, would a firearm or bear spray prevented either of these attacks? I will appreciate reading and answering your comments, so please post them below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Chilkoot Lake, just outside of Haines, Alaska. This area sits at the end of Chilkoot Bay, which reaches a little over 70 miles into the state from the sea, and is a destination on the inside passage tours. The area showcases stunning views of fjords, islands, and forested mountains that postcard photographers dream of. The mountains here are not very high in elevation, but are extremely rugged and steep. The tree species in this area is very diverse, with red cedar, fir, spruce, hemlock, and tamarack tree decorating the hills. Various species of willow, alder, and aspen round out the smaller trees in the area. Animals you might see include moose, mountain goats, sheep, and black and brown bears. On Saturday, February 6, 2021, 38-year-old Bart Pieschel and his friends Graham Kraft and Jeff Moskowitz were almost ready to begin a remote backcountry ski trip down a course they had scouted out for a while now. The plan was for the men to hike up a certain point in the route and then ski back down through the challenging and untouched path they planned out. This practice is very dangerous due to the fact that there is no rescue team or medical team such as those at typical ski resorts. The men were on their own and they knew it. The men did come prepared though, sort of. They didn't bring bear spray nor had they brought any firearms, bear bells or any other form of bear deterrent given bears were known to be hibernating at this point of the year. Even if they had brought bear spray, low temperatures are known to limit its effective range. They did bring a particularly important piece of technological equipment, a satellite communication device made by Garmin called InReach, which would relay their GPS coordinates just in case they might need it. They expected bears to be sleeping for a few more months, leaving the slopes and valleys to the skiers, or at least that was the plan. The three friends spent the better part of the day hiking up the mountain. As the three men hiked up the mountainside to about 1,600 feet in elevation, they unknowingly were approaching a denned-up sow brown bear and her little cubs about 12.30 p.m. The den was hidden amongst the duff and snow and nearly invisible to the men as they approached its opening. A little bit of information about bears and hibernation is in order to understand this episode more. 
As bears hibernate, they do not continue to sleep in an uninterrupted manner. They routinely wake up and move around their dens and change positions. They rarely emerge from their dens and are not truly hibernating in the strict sense. Experts call this state torpor and consider it to be similar to hibernation. They don't urinate or defecate very much while they are hibernating and don't eat or drink either. Experts explain that hibernation is an evolutionary adaptation which helps bears get through periods of the year when their food sources are low or unavailable. The facts surrounding why this mama bear wasn't sleeping blissfully while her little cubs nursed for a few more months aren't certain, but she was clearly disturbed by the men as they approached her den. It is a known phenomenon that bears in the southeast part of Alaska hibernate for shorter time frames due to more mild weather than areas farther north. As Bart crossed the hill just beside the den, the sow exploded from the snow covering the opening to her den and immediately knocked him down. She quickly swiped her claws toward his head as he flailed his arms toward her in an ineffective attempt to defend himself. As his arms were stretched toward the sow's face, she clamped her jaws onto his left arm and drove her teeth into his flesh, severely breaking his arm bones. She tossed her head back and forth and ripped tissue as she raked his head and right arm with her claws. Bart was terrified and quickly figured out that he had to play dead before she killed him. He rolled away from the bear and relaxed, allowing the steep terrain to work in his favor. His limp body tumbled down the slope and away from the angry sow and out of the vision of his friends. Kraft later stated that the attack on Bart lasted for the better part of a minute and that the men could see a cub in the den. Bart's ski buddy, Kraft, looked on as his friend slid down the slope and watched as the sow immediately ran off. He could see Bart's slide trail through the snow, dotted with blood and broken ski poles. Bart's equipment was randomly scattered down the slope as he tumbled and provided an easy trail to guide Kraft and Moskowitz to his side. Moskowitz was fairly well prepared for an accident and began pulling out equipment from his backpack. He pulled out a thermal blanket, warm water, sleeping pads, some jackets, and a first aid kit. The two uninjured men began assessing Bart's condition. He was wet and cold as the temperature began to dip to around 15 degrees as the evening sun was near setting. He had visible puncture wounds from the sow's teeth and was bleeding from several places on his head, hands, and arms. Bart was in a lot of pain from the attack and likely from the fall. His friends were impressed with how he remained positive while they administered first aid to his injuries. As they took care of Bart, they used the satellite device to signal for a Coast Guard helicopter and sent their GPS coordinates and altitude they were located at. The first 30 minutes were very tense as they worried if Bart was going to live. He seemed to be drifting into shock. Bart's friends used a backpack frame to make a splint for his broken arm. They quickly wrapped him in as many layers they could pull over the splint they put on his injured arm. They laid next to him to try to keep him warm and comfortable as they told him stories to distract him and lift his spirits. After a short wait, the men heard the silence of the slopes broken by the sounds of a helicopter approaching their location. An MH-60 Jayhawk helicopter with a five-person crew was dispatched from Sitka about 100 miles away, but arrived right on time. This crew routinely trained on retrieving people in need of rescue in steep terrain, so they knew exactly how to handle it. The skiers used bright-colored fabrics to signal the copter, which made finding them much easier for the helicopter crew. They watched as the rescue party hefted a tethered litter out the side and lowered it on a cable along with a medic and a rescue swimmer, who was sent to evaluate Bart's condition. The rescue team loaded Bart into the litter and began lifting him from the precarious location and on board the copter. Kraft and Moskowitz made their way down the hill on their own as the Coast Guard helicopter flew Bart to Juneau, where his most severe injuries were immediately treated. Surgeons placed pins in his left arm to hold his bones together so they could mend. A second surgery would be required later to remove the pins after healing. Regarding the sow and what happened with her and her cubs, the authorities did not pursue her considering the men approached her cubs and her den. They viewed this attack as a defensive attack and she did not try to cash Bart at any point and immediately left the area. There is no source I could find indicating if she returned to recover her cubs 
or simply return to the den. I can imagine that the stress from the event and the clatter created by the helicopter as it recovered Bart and his friends that she may have been frightened from the location of her den. The fate of her cubs is unknown. While his friend was convalescing in the hospital, Kraft established a GoFundMe account and raised $32,000 to help his family offset the medical bills. Bart didn't have insurance, so this was a big help for him. In 2019, a study on bear attacks in Alaska noted that 10 people died from bear attacks between the years 2000 and 2017. There were 68 people hospitalized for injuries during 66 bear attacks in the same time period in Alaska alone. A peculiarity in the data showed that the attacks seemed to happen in spurts with a few people being attacked or killed, and then a period of years passing without a fatality. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Why do you think this sow was not hibernating at this time of year? Do you think firearms or bear spray could have prevented this attack? Do you think Bart got off easy with his limited injuries? How do you think her cubs fared? I will be glad to read your comments, so post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you to Matt Emerson for emailing me and inspiring this episode. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the hot and dry mountains of Caliente, California. The arid climate features mountains and hills sparsely covered in dry grasses, low-growing desert bushes like Big Berry and Common Manzanita, Fremont Cottonwood, and the Blue Oak Tree. The ground cover is seasonally adorned with California fuchsia, western columbine, and deer grass, plus many more. The animals of the area include coyotes, jackrabbits, cottontails, mule deer, and bobcats. The more dangerous inhabitants of this area include black bears, on the higher slopes of the desert mountains, forests of various kinds of oak, willow, mesquite, and sycamore dominate the skyline and provide shade for all passers-by. On July 22nd of 2018, Elena Hansen was enjoying the freedom and space of her sprawling 70-acre ranchette. She enjoyed working with the horses, but still had a lot of work to put in just for maintenance. She always had chores to do to maintain the property, but the 56-year-old single mother embraced the hard work required. On this day, she was focused on fixing a water line for a new vineyard she was planning on constructing in the near future. The spring fed into a concrete box with a floodgate, and the spring had started to decrease in its flow. To Elena, that meant she would have to dig out any obstructions to keep the water flowing in order to execute her plan. She hiked up the box canyon where the spring was located with her two trusty ranch hands, Deke, who was a huge English mastiff, and Archimedes, a very large Irish wolfhound. Her dogs were her best friends in many ways, and today's events would once again confirm that fact to Elena. There was nothing alarming about the day, and she felt no strange or foreboding feelings as she worked. In fact, Deke and Archimedes had wandered off a short distance and found some shade to take a nap. The tough rancher entered her irrigation box and began clearing mud and gravel from the mouth of the spring that fed it. As she worked in the summer heat, she could see the spring begin to produce a greater flow of water. She had to stop periodically to wipe her brow and rest. As she worked, she drew the attention of a particularly predatory visitor who had somehow managed to slip past the sleeping dogs and approach to within ten feet of Elena. After digging around a bit more, Elena stood up to recompose herself. This time she was not refreshed by rest. Instead, she was alarmed by a rather small black bear only a few feet from her. She noticed the bear had simply been standing there, barely hidden by a small willow patch, as if it was waiting for her to notice it. As soon as their eyes met, the angry black bear pounced on Elena. She quickly tried to fold herself into the fetal position in the wet sand to protect her head and neck as best she could. The bear immediately clamped its jaws onto her head and bit and pulled at her ears. As it pulled her by her head, it managed to bite onto her face. It immediately began to tear skin and tissues from her face as it bit. It used its mass of only about 150 pounds to pin her to the ground by sitting on her. Elena is only around 100 pounds, so she wasn't much of a challenge to control for the bear. Even a small bear is much stronger than a very large man and quicker by far than a human. As the bear pressed Elena into the sand, it focused its attack on her head and face. It was clearly trying to rip her head off and possibly crush her skull. The terror that filled her mind was paralyzing, but somehow she fought back as hard as she could. 
The black bear sank its large canine teeth into Elena's right eye socket and ripped a small piece of flesh from that area. She reported hearing her tissues being ripped and the chomping sound the bear's jaws made as it meted out its destruction on her. It next focused on destroying her nose and mouth. Its jaws crushed and sliced the skin and tissues of her nose and rendered it into crushed and mutilated meat. She indicated that she could feel and hear her eyeball pop as the bear's teeth punctured it. The bear took Elena's face in its mouth and shook its head back and forth violently as she heard her bones popping and crunching beneath its pressure. She looked up at the face of the bear in time to see it spitting out an uncertain number of her teeth it had chewed from her skull. Elena realized that she had to fight for her life. This bear wasn't just surprised into a defensive attack, but was obviously trying to kill her by tearing her head off. She silently thought to herself that this bear doesn't know just who it's attacking. She took her thumbnail and jammed it into the bear's eye as hard as she could and began yelling for her dogs. Immediately after this last gasp of self-preservation, Elena lost consciousness. After a few seconds of unconsciousness, Elena woke up to the growling, grunting, and howling of the fracas that broke out between her dogs and the bear. As the dogs recognized what was going on, they attacked the bear as it sat on Elena. Now, all three large animals were fighting right on top of her. She could see a blurry series of teeth snapping and fur flying as the three animals bloodied each other. She was losing blood quickly as the animals battled, but managed to wiggle out from underneath the violent battle and tumbled down the hill a few hundred yards as the bear attacked Deke's stomach area. She struggled to her feet and stumbled a little over a quarter of a mile back to her vehicle, led by Archimedes and Deke, who had sustained minor injuries. As she situated herself in the driver's seat, she was shocked by her appearance in the rearview mirror, but was pleased to note that her white baseball cap was still on her head. What she thought was her cap was actually her mostly severed scalp. She loaded them all into her vehicle and drove the three miles down the road to a local fire station. The firemen were surprised and amazed to see a woman with her face in tatters drive herself up and start asking for help. Captain Kurt Merrill recalls asking her her name. She responded, Elena Hansen. He knew her well, but he couldn't recognize her through the destruction to her face. They immediately tended to her wounds as best they could while waiting for the Life Flight helicopter which would take her to the UCLA Medical Center for treatment. At the hospital, the doctors discovered that the bear's attack had damaged Elena's orbit of her eye and part of her cheekbone had been consumed by the bear. The bear also completely crushed her nasal bridge and even chewed off her ears, lips, and a segment of her left cheekbone. The damage to her dental arcade was tremendous as well, as the bear had broken her jaw, ripped out 14 of her teeth, torn up her gums, and broken the upper palate of her mouth. Medical professionals somehow put her face back together, with over 1,000 stitches during a 10-hour initial operation, describing her injuries as the worst they'd ever seen. She had to endure several plastic surgeries to make the reconstructed parts of her face look as normal as possible. Only a few years after the attack and subsequent surgeries, she says nobody in public ever seems to notice her scars, unless she points them out. She's quoted as saying, You'd be amazed what you can do if you have to, but you have to do something. The key to surviving is it doesn't matter what you do, just start the ball rolling. Do something, and then improvise as you go along. You never know where it's going to end up, but it's better than lying there and letting something eat your head off. Archimedes and Deke survived with minor injuries and still enjoy protecting her, even while they nap. The firemen at the fire station admired her toughness as they pointed out that she not only drove herself there, but had the wherewithal to give them her personal information. Elena's son, Alec Newman, said that it would take a lot more than some punk bear to get rid of his mother. A further comment of Elena's is quoted as, These scars are hard-earned trophies for what I've been through. They're actually something I could be grateful for. I'm proud of them. I can go talk to little girls and say, I'm still beautiful, even with these. Regarding her sentiments toward the bear, Elena is quoted as saying, They've got as much right to be here as I do, but until they start paying property tax, I'm going to assert my dominance. As for the bear, there's no source of what happened to the bear. To my knowledge, it has not been killed, and no one's pursuing it for such aims. On a more somber note, Elena's insurance company refused to cover all but 20% of her medical bills. Her expenses are calculated at around $300,000. She maintains she was first mauled by a bear, then mauled by Blue Cross. The podcast recounting the entire event is pinned in the comment below this video and gives you a great perspective on how admirable and hilarious Elena is. There is also a link to her book recounting her attack titled Chomp 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 in the sources. 
Since YouTube guidelines prohibit the posting of pictures as gruesome as Elena's, I've posted them on my Patreon, and the link is below, so click on it and take a look. After reviewing the details of Elena's attack, I'm left with a few questions. First, do you think her bear attack was a predatory attack or a territorial attack? If bears see us as a food source, then that's a very frightening reality. If they see us as competition, then they may continue to see us as an existential threat. Next, do you think she would have survived if her dogs had not come to her rescue? Also, do you think that the bear attacked her because she was occupying one of the few water resources in the area? Finally, would you agree that she is one of the most beautiful and witty bear attack victims we've ever covered on this channel? Please post your comments in the comments section below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the majestic Rocky Mountains near the headwaters of the Navajo River. The San Juan Wilderness Area is a rugged combination of forest and granite peaks ranging in elevation from around 8,000 to 12,000 feet. The valleys flush with deer, elk, coyotes, and black bear, but the ecological niche of the grizzly now goes unfilled. On the eve of September 23, 1979, Colorado native and hunting guide Ed Wiseman slips quietly through the forest as the day of elk hunting winds down. Ed thinks of himself as a bit of a throwback mountain man who enjoys living as close to nature as he can get. That is why he enjoys archery hunting. It beckons to something primordial in his spirit. Mike Needery is the 25-year-old hunting partner of Ed and is about 300 yards from his hunting partner looking for an elk. The Kansan handles the steep terrain well and enjoys their time in the mountains. He glances ahead and sees what he thinks is a large black bear. The bear lifts its nose to the breeze and gets a good sniff of Mike and heads down the draw toward Ed. Ed hears a rustling in the bushes nearby as he turns to take a good look at what is making the bushes shake so much a 400-pound female grizzly erupts from the bush and steams toward him. He immediately recognizes her as a grizzly but knows they haven't been observed in Colorado in over 27 years. The sow closes the short distance before Ed can do anything other than drop to the ground and pretend to be dead. This is what the textbooks and professionals say to do, after all. He thuds to the ground, but apparently this bear is not fooled by his acting performance. She immediately clamps her jaws onto his right leg and bites over and over several times, tearing his pants, skin, and flesh severely. Next, she bites into his right shoulder with her 2.5-inch canines puncturing tissues to the bone and creating massive wounds wherever she bites. Ed feels his flesh being torn and the pain is electrifying. When the sow continues the attack for more than a few seconds, he realizes he may need to fight for his life. As the rage of her attack continues, Ed takes inventory of any possible weapons in his area. He's an avid bow hunter and does not carry a firearm, and bear spray is still being developed. He looks to his left and sees his arrows, now knocked from his quiver, laying on the ground within arm's reach. They are good and sharp from the time he spent sharpening before he left camp this morning. Ed reaches over and grasps one of the aluminum arrows and in one fluid motion plunges it into the grizzly's neck like a long dagger. The arrow shaft breaks in two and blood sprays in his face. He hit Pater with his first strike, severing the sow's juggler vein. Unfazed by the fatal wound to her neck, the grizzly continues to tear him with her claws and bite him severely. Ed reaches up and removes the arrow shaft from her neck and plunges it into her chest just behind her leg. This blow strikes her in the heart and causes her to withdraw a short distance. She slowly walks and turns back toward Ed, then lays down and puts her head on her paws. Colorado's last grizzly bear breathes her final breath and finds peace. Mike hears Ed's loud scream, so he hurries to where the two parted company. The only clue he can find is Ed's black wool cap, and it has blood on it. He is immediately concerned for his guide and friend, as it looks like he's been attacked and dragged away by a bear. That is when he hears Ed's cries for help and runs to his companion's side. Ed is in bad shape, very bad shape. He has obviously broken bones, exposed tendons and muscle tissue, and deep gashes over his shoulders and legs. Ed is already working on his own rescue plan and asks Mike to ride his horse back to camp to get help. Life Flight will fly him to the hospital and all this drama should be over soon. Ed came from tough stock, a steel mill worker for a father and a stoic and tough mother. He was never overly worried about any setback. This toughness will get him through. The rescue copter arrived just after sunrise and Ed was flown to the hospital in Alamosa. After a week, he thinks he's ready to be released, but when a doctor removes one of his dressings on his thigh and sticks his entire finger into one of the wounds, he suddenly understands recovery will take some time. 
The doctor drains the pus and fluids from the wound and repacks the dressing. After two more weeks, Ed is released to home care, but just six months later guides a client on a cougar hunt and in a further three months returns to the attack site without the assistance of a walking cane. He worked for 20 more years as a Colorado hunting guide. He now works at Walmart to stay busy. He still has the broken arrow shaft and broadhead he used to kill the bear. The bear's pelt and skeleton still sit on the basement of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, with her skull on display on the second floor. When experts examined her corpse, they discovered that she was around 20 years old and had severe arthritis. She also probably never bore cubs. Ed says he doesn't worry about the attack, he says with a smile, but for those who have yet to be attacked. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the interior of northern British Columbia, Canada, near a small town called Gitanyo. The mountains tower above a mile high at their peaks, and the valleys between them are broad and heavily forested. In most of these broad valleys, tangles of willow, alder, and tall grasses screen elk, deer, moose, and woodland caribou. You may even see American bison browsing on grasses munching their way across meadows. Predators include cougars, wolves, coyotes, and black and brown bears stalk the riparian zones to surprise their prey. It is in this setting that our episode takes place today. On June 26th of 2019, 54-year-old Alex Woods was walking alone near Gixon Village, just a few miles from his village, Gitanyo. He was a forest pathologist and was going to check tree roots for a disease known as armillaria root disease in old-growth stands of forest. Alex was a lean-built man who wore his silver beard trimmed short. He had the GPS coordinates all entered into his device, but was an old-school type of guy, so he took a heading and hiked in the general direction. He had spent the last few decades in the deep woods and routinely hunted and floated the rivers. As he walked through the foliage, he noticed a freshly broken stem of a fireweed plant. Knowing this doesn't happen unless a large animal has passed by, he took mental note to pay attention to his surroundings. He began yelling, Yo, bear, repeatedly to let anything that was around him know he was there. He didn't want to end up in a close-range standoff with a moose, let alone a surprised bear. A few hundred yards into his journey, Alex came up on a steep slope covered in hemlock and balsam fir, burned from a wildfire a year or two before, and was open consequently. The small creek at the bottom refreshed plants and animals alike along its banks. Given the noise from the creek, Alex decided to raise his voice while yelling Yo Bear as he descended the bank. Just beyond halfway down the slope, he saw some morel mushrooms and plucked a couple for his dinner later. After he picked up the mushrooms and stood, he noticed a black bear running directly at him. It wasn't grunting or growling. The bear didn't have any drool dripping from its lips. It simply sped toward him as if it were going to run straight past him. It closed from about 100 feet when he first saw it and quickly climbed the steep slope toward him so fast Alex wasn't sure what he could do. Alex quickly maneuvered himself behind a small tree with a tree laying at its trunk and began yelling at the bear. He reached his hand into his vest and pulled out his bear spray, figuring that one blast from it would probably send the bear scampering in the other direction. The cap on the bear spray was stuck and he fumbled with it, trying to get it to function as the bear approached him. The next thing Alex knew, he saw a huge bear head with its mouth wide open and ready to bite into his abdomen. One thing Alex had working for him was the steep slope he was climbing down. As the bear labored up the slope, its head happened to line up for a perfect defensive strike from Alex. He yelled again, then mustered his bravery and kicked the bear as hard as he could right in the jaw. Between Alex's kick and the steepness of the slope, the bear slid back down the slope several feet. It then began to run around the tree to get at him. As the bear approached him again, Alex yelled louder and kicked it in the head as hard as he could one more time. This really rattled the bear, as it ran to a nearby tree and climbed several feet up and stared at Alex. The man was hoping that this encounter was coming to an end after the brief struggle, but in the world of bears, struggle is always a part of survival. Whenever Alex went into the woods, he carried his father's hatchet strapped into a pocket of his work vest, right near his bear spray. He had always felt it was a good tool to have handy in a pinch, and he was absolutely right this day. After a short staring session, the bear slowly clawed its way back down the tree. As it did so, Alex reached into the pouch on the back of his work vest and pulled out his father's hatchet. He was hoping the bear would take this moment to run away, but the bear quickly dashed toward him, again to attack with more vigor this time. Alex swung the hatchet with grim intention and sank its sharpened bit deeply into the bear's head. The bear immediately slumped over and rolled down the slope. 
It laid on its back, but was still breathing. Alex knew better than to believe his eyes when it came to bears, as they are known for quickly regaining their feet and killing people. He was protected, standing behind the tree in the deadfall, and didn't want to give that spot up without certainty. After several minutes of observing the bear, he decided to scramble back up the slope and put as much distance between him and the bear as he could. Alex kept his eyes on the bear as he backed up the slope, then headed directly to his truck. He was still very frightened and continually checked over his shoulder every few steps as he went. Visions of the bear rolling over and regaining its feet drove him to quicken his pace until he entered the cab of his truck. Once Alex returned to town, he called up the British Columbia Conservation Officer Service and relayed the unbelievable story to them. Investigators headed up to the location and found the bear was still alive, but just barely. The bear was immobilized by the hatchet blow as its skull was opened up. As a humane gesture, the officers put the bear down and ended its headache better than aspirin. The officers returned to town and let Alex know that the bear had cubs and that may be why she was so defensive. He was still torn up by the information as he would have never wanted to orphan bear cubs. He rehearsed in his mind how he had done everything that had worked for 35 years in the woods. He yelled and made plenty of noise to make sure the bear would know he was there, but maybe the creek covered up his attempts to be bear aware. Several experts indicated that the sow was demonstrating predatory behavior in her attack of Alex. He was lucky that day. The officers examined the sow and found her to be healthy and even on the larger side for bears in the area, weighing in at just under 200 pounds. Alex noted that streams were lower this year than previous years and that that may be an indicator of ecological distress in the area. As a warning to other people who visit the woods, Alex says, You have to make sure to keep your bear spray handy. It won't do you any good if you don't know how to use it or can't quickly access it. He laments that if he'd been able to use his bear spray, perhaps this sow and her cubs would still be alive. Alex says that when he goes into the woods from now on, he will change his approach. He's used to hunting by himself, but isn't so sure anymore. He's concerned that the intensity and danger of this confrontation will stay with him for quite a while. After reviewing the details of this episode, I have a few questions for you. Do you think that the bear was trying to prey on Alex, or did she have other motives? Why weren't her cubs anywhere near her during the attack? Do you think Alex's attempt to alert nearby animals instigated the attack? I wonder what the officers did with her cubs after putting her out of her misery. I enjoy reading your comments, so please post them below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to southern Siberia to a province in the Russian Federation called Tuva. This area is poverty-stricken and is renowned for its crime and drug abuse. The temperature here can drop to minus 80 degrees in the winter and soar to over 100 degrees in the summer. The Siberian larch, laurel leaf poplar, and the Scots pine are among the tallest trees here, and kites and kestrels hunt the chi and tufted hair grasses. A few of the common animals here are wolves, snow leopards, mountain sheep, antelope, reindeer, and brown bears. It is in this wilderness setting that our episode takes place. On June 1st of 2019, 29-year-old Nikolai Urgit was headed out into the wilderness near his hometown of Kut with several of his friends to gather horns and antlers that were shed by animals in the winter. Some of the animals that died in the winter would leave behind their horns that could be sold on the black market for money. This activity required a permit issued by the local government, but Nikolai and his friends declined to purchase theirs as it bit into their profits. In his everyday life, Nikolai was a school caretaker and happy father of two sons and one daughter. He was raising with his 25-year-old wife, Ida. Given the condition of the local economy, Nikolai and his friends couldn't afford firearms, nor bear spray. They didn't even bother bringing knives along with them. They weren't planning for any confrontations in which they may need them and wouldn't be long in the woods. They'd planned a quick trip and to return to their families by nightfall with their haul. Shortly after arriving at the area they planned to search in, they began to spread out and looked in their own spots for antlers and horns. As Nikolai walked around for a few hours, he began to push his way through some dense brush. He emerged on the far side of the bushes and glanced up. His eyes widened as a massive brown bear filled his vision, glaring at him. The bear was just a few yards away, and Nikolai had walked nearly right up beside the giant bear, which was estimated to weigh around a thousand pounds. As soon as their eyes met, the bear flung itself toward the man, letting out an ear-shattering roar as it came. Nikolai clenched his fists and yelled at the bear as it advanced, hoping the bear would bluff charge him, then run away. But if bears operated on our hopes or expectations of them, we would all be safe when we encountered them. 
The bear didn't bluff charge, but opened its mouth wide and reached out for his arm. Nikolai instinctively punched the bear in the head, but this didn't even make the bear flinch, as it immediately bit onto his forearm and leapt on top of him. The bear quickly bit into his abdomen and tore at his flesh, then moved up to his chest and ripped flesh there. He was careful to point out whenever he relayed this story that the bear never clawed him, but exclusively used its powerful jaws. It apparently wanted to devour him immediately. While being savaged by the angry bear, Nikolai didn't smell anything. He didn't feel anything during the attack. He began to lose any regard for his own life, but thoughts of his children and wife flashed through his mind. He loved them so much and didn't want them to be without him. After the bear bit at his chest, it changed its savage focus to his head. It clamped its massive jaws onto his skull and began tearing his scalp just above his left forehead. One of its canines punched into his left eye orbit, tearing its flesh from the middle of his eyelid back a few inches toward his temple. At that point, Nikolai opened his eyes, and his entire visual field was filled, with the bear's huge gleaming teeth closing over the width of his face. As the bear bit into his face, he felt enormous pain shoot through his body like electricity. The man instinctively tensed up in preparation for the pressure of the bear's jaws, and as he did this, he clenched his jaws. The pictures of his wounds are too graphic for YouTube and have been uploaded to our Patreon link, linked below the video. But I warn you, they are not for anyone with a weak stomach. Suddenly the bear roared loudly and ran quickly through the forest away from Nikolai. He continued to roar in a distressed way as he fled. Nikolai's focus now returned to himself and his wounds. His mouth felt strange and he was certain his lips were torn off and now inside of his mouth as he could feel his mouth was full of something. He began to move his jaws and felt a chunk of meat moving around in there. He grows certain he's bit off his own tongue in the melee and sits up to spit it out. As he disgorges whatever's in his mouth onto the dirt, he can feel his tongue still in his own mouth. He quickly examines the foreign flesh and realizes he'd somehow bitten the big chunk of the bear's tongue off while it was attacking his face. He observes the severed bear tongue on the ground now losing its color due to lack of blood flow and would later describe it as white. Nikolai is shaking from the adrenaline and stress of the event as he checks himself over and assesses his wounds. Between the bear roaring and Nikolai calling for his friends, it doesn't take long for his party to emerge from the brush and gather at his side. The other men organize an impromptu litter and load their friend on top of it for the trip back to their vehicle. Nikolai is quickly transported to the hospital in the capital city of Kizil, 90 miles away, where he spends the next month convalescing apart from his family. While being treated with preventative medicines to ward off infection, Nikolai expresses that he misses his wife and children. While in the hospital, a skin graft was taken from his arm and set on his forehead to help it heal quicker. Upon hearing about his harrowing fight with the bear, his wife Ida broke down into tears and was angry with him for going to such a remote and dangerous place. Nikolai is heralded as a local hero by members of his village, but he expresses regret at his scars and the damage done to his left eye during the attack. He reports that he's ashamed to walk down the street as people stare at his scars. His left eye is still not functioning correctly and may never. His neighbors think of him as a hero, but he maintains that he did what he had to do to survive. After gathering and analyzing this information, I'm left with a few questions. Do you think Nikolai would have survived the bear attack if he hadn't bitten the bear's tongue off? Why do you think the bear didn't rake him with his claws? Do you think a firearm or bear spray would have made any difference in this attack? Why did Nikolai describe the bear's tongue as white-colored? Was the bear diseased in some way? It will be great to read your thoughts in the comment section below, so post your ideas and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the western seaboard of the coast of British Columbia, Canada, a remote timber operation in the rugged and forested hillside near a place called Drainy Inlet off of the River Inlet area is our destination. The west coast of Canada is the largest temperate rainforest in the world and is only one of seven around the planet. This designation means that the area receives more than 55 inches of rainfall each year, providing an abundance of plant life that directly or indirectly supports an abundance of animal life. The forest canopy consists of towering pine, fir, cedar, and spruce trees that cast a protective shade over the rhododendron, maple, and dogwood trees in the lower canopy. Berry bushes include salmon berries and blackberries, plus a few more. 
In this wet and mild environment, mosses, mushrooms, and other fungi thrive while consuming the dead plant mass that gathers on the forest floors. Common animals in this area include Roosevelt elk, moose, and black-tailed deer. To keep these forest plant browsers' populations in check, the predators of the area include cougars, wolves, black bears, and grizzly bears. The month of March is a transitional time for the grizzlies of this area. Any snow that may have accumulated is melting off, which allows the nutritious sedge grass and other plants to grow. Feeding on spring sprouts is a vital part of grizzly seasonal cycles, as the grass provides needed vitamins and minerals depleted during hibernation, and the fiber in the grass cleanses their digestive system. It is also the time when protective sows bring their little cubs out to learn the life skills she will instill in them over the next few years. Sows are extremely protective during this time and are a danger to humans and male bears alike. When grizzlies emerge from their dens, they are essentially starving, having not eaten for months. Given that the salmon runs may be several weeks away, if they don't find food soon after emerging, they may not fatten up fast enough for the next hibernation. They depend on the forest for their livelihood, just like Ryan Arsenal did. He was a forest engineer with Capacity Forest Management for the past eight years. Ryan would spend part of his time working from the corporate office, but the rest of his time he was out at the remote logging camps, marking trees selected for harvest. He's from a small town on the east side of Vancouver Island called Campbell River, which is where his wife and two young daughters stayed. Ryan would happily reunite with his family when he wasn't working at the remote camps, but while he was out there, he worked very hard. In his role with the company, Ryan would assess the cutting zone, which is the portion of the forest the company was targeting to pull timber from. After that, he would go through and paint or tape tree species that the timber company was permitted to harvest. The company placed a lot of trust in Ryan, and he was considered part of the heart and soul of the organization. It is hard to imagine that such a beautiful place would present or conceal any danger, but Ryan and his logging teams routinely ran into black bears and grizzly bears. The bears never seemed interested in being around people, and if you saw them at all, you saw them leaving. They simply had too much food in their habitat to even consider stalking a human being, which would be far from their typical fare in the forest. At around 10.30 a.m. of March 22, 2017, Ryan worked his way through a stand of trees as he maintained visual contact with his four other crewmen. Company policy required a close working distance to prevent injuries and ensure their workers were safe and accounted for. The crewmen hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. They heard no growls or roars. There were no grizzly tracks or scat that they found. None of them saw the enraged grizzly that appeared out of nowhere, only a few yards from Ryan. As soon as Ryan saw the grizzly, he hid behind the only tree he could find, which is a very small pine tree. Ryan tried to startle the angry bear by yelling and screaming at it as it approached him. Nothing Ryan could do seemed to dissuade the grizzly as it charged toward him. He lifted his heavy logging boots and kicked the grizzly right in the muzzle, but all that did was give the bear Ryan's right leg to pull him down with. The bear drove him onto his back before any of the other crewmen could react. The other loggers looked on in horror as the bear clamped onto Ryan's lower right leg, shattering his fibula bone as it did so in a single bite. The grizzly quickly switched its attack to Ryan's head and tore a huge gash across his scalp. Ryan threw his hands up around his head, hoping that the bear would spare him any more pain. Bears aren't known for acknowledging the pain of their prey, though. The grizzly drove its enormous canines right through Ryan's wrist as he feebly tried to protect his skull from being crushed. The entire time the bear was breaking Ryan's bones and tearing his flesh with its jaws, its claws were raking him all over his upper torso. Fortunately for him, his thick work vest bore the brunt of nearly all of it and spared him additional trauma. The five lumber workers were not unprepared for this. The company issued them bear spray to use in just this kind of instance. It just happened so quickly that they couldn't respond before the bear inflicted crippling damage on Ryan's body. As the others watched Ryan scream and fight with the grizzly, one of them dug through the pocket of a small pack, searching for the bear spray. Once he took hold of it, he let out a primal holler as he ran toward the bear while directing the orange cloud into the bear's face. As soon as the bear lifted its head from Ryan and its nostrils and eyes filled with the bear spray, It began coughing and gagging. The bear spray had a potent and immediate effect on the bear as it broke off the attack on Ryan and took refuge in the nearby brush. His fellow crewmen rushed to Ryan's side as he lay on his back in obvious and severe pain. 
The large laceration on his scalp poured blood, and the injuries to his wrist and lower right leg left his limbs non-functional and bent abnormally in places. After quickly assessing Ryan's injuries, the other crewmen radioed their base and requested a helicopter to his location. They administered first aid as best they could while they waited for its arrival. Given the rugged and steep terrain, the helicopter couldn't land near Ryan, so they carried a stretcher downhill for three hours to get to him. As the first aid crew approached Ryan's location with the stretcher, the grizzly emerged from the brush and charged toward them. There were several men in this group, and that seemed to be a good reason for the grizzly to break off its attack on them. It seemed confused as it turned back into the brush and disappeared. The medical team loaded Ryan onto the stretcher after checking out his wounds. The helicopter immediately flew Ryan to the medical center at Port Hardy, where he received a blood transfusion, as well as staples to close the gash on his scalp. Shortly after that, he was flown to the Victoria General Hospital in Victoria, B.C. for antibiotic treatment and further surgical repair to his broken bones and shredded tissues in his arm and right leg. The medical staff at both facilities described Ryan's wounds as major injuries and very serious. Ryan had a prolonged recovery with many months of painful and difficult physical rehabilitation before regaining basic function and use of his injured arm and right leg. I could find no source indicating if Ryan terminated his employment with the logging company so it's assumed that he remained with the organization. Immediately after the bear attack, Capacity Forest Management worked with wildlife officials to deploy a specialized predator attack team to conduct an investigation. They could not locate the bear as it had fled following the second attack on the crewman. The logging company acted very quickly in response to the attack by providing trauma counseling to the crewman. Ryan's family had some difficulty in dealing with the implications of his grizzly attack, but were comforted by the knowledge that he would survive. If the timber company hadn't taken the proactive steps of training their loggers how to handle confrontations with wildlife and how to dispense bear spray, Ryan's situation may have easily ended in his death. A company spokesman stated that this was a purpose-driven bear that had a reason for being where it was. This ominous statement shed light on what they believed was the nature of the attack. They expressed gratitude for the brave response of Ryan's fellow crewmen and that the bear was unable to get his head in its mouth as it tried to do. British Columbia Conservation Service Officer Scott Norris described the attack as a major attack and stated that it wasn't cut and dry in terms of what would be the response to the bear's behavior. A biologist who specialized in carnivores was consulted to understand the bear's behavior. He noted that given there were no cubs observed during either of the bear's attacks on the crewman, it is doubted to be a sow protecting her cubs. A further assumption was made that it was the same bear that attacked Ryan as well as charged the rescue party. They concluded that bears don't typically hunt humans, so jumping to the conclusion that it attacked out of hunger may be an errant decision. The Ministry of Environment decided after much consideration that the bear was acting defensively and that it would not be destroyed. It didn't try to claim Ryan as its food cache and didn't return to the attack site. But this was biased based on the intervention of his co-workers. The bear may have returned had they not intervened in such a powerful and brave manner. They decided to let it live and hope it would have no further hostile interactions with humans. In 2018, authorities estimated that there were 14,925 grizzlies in all of British Columbia. Now that seems to be a pretty precise number to me, and I have to wonder about the methods they used to arrive at this tally. In the year 2015 alone, there were four grizzly attacks on humans. Since 1984, there have been six human fatalities due to grizzly bear attacks and 94 injuries recorded in British Columbia alone. That roughly calculates out to one human fatality every 6.2 years and about two injuries each year from grizzlies. After reviewing the details of Ryan Arsenault's grizzly bear mauling, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think that bear attacked out of predatory or defensive motives? Given the speed of the attack, do you think a firearm would have prevented this attack? Are you surprised that the logging company didn't provide shotguns loaded with slugs as well as bear spray for the crewman's safety? Why do you think there are so many bear attacks on loggers? I'll gladly read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to familiar territory a place where bears can be very angry if they are disturbed, surprised, or just having a bad day. Well, I guess that describes anywhere that bears reside, so specifically, we are going to the Madison Valley in western Montana. 
This area may sound familiar if you have watched our episode regarding the fatal grizzly mauling on Charles Mock, which happened only a few miles away. The Madison Valley is just across the good side of the border of Idaho and Montana and is within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which sprawls across the northwest corner of Wyoming, the southwest corner of Montana, and the northeast corner of Idaho, well past the park boundaries. In this area, the needs of people and bears are precariously balanced by regulations, laws, and constraints on human activity. You might even say that only the foolhardy would adventure into grizzly country here, even if they are well prepared. The Madison Valley stretches north from the park toward a small farming town called Ennis. In the broad valley, the land is flat and covered with grasses and sagebrush that antelope and coyotes dash across. As the valley inclines to peaks that reach around 10,000 feet in elevation, stands of fir, pine, aspen, and spruce cover the ground in a green blanket that hides mule deer, white-tailed deer, elk, and moose. The predators of this area include cougars, wolves, black bears, and grizzly bears. To clarify the difference between a brown bear and a grizzly bear, grizzly bears are brown bears, but the name is typically used to reference smaller and more aggressive inland brown bears who usually do not have the benefit of a seasonal salmon run to fatten up like the coastal brownies do along the west coast of Canada and Alaska. Their life is more demanding given they have to compete over the same food sources as black bears and even some that wolves and cougars eat. With four large apex predators in this area, it is no wonder that sow grizzlies defend the lives of their cubs with such ferocity and power. In the early morning twilight of October 1, 2016, 50-year-old Todd Orr was planning on using a day off from work to go scouting for elk hunting season. Todd is a fit and tough trail engineer. Whenever a park system or national forest wants to install a new trail route, they call Todd, and he examines the topography and destinations of the proposed trail and designs routes that provide the best views and connect to the existing trails. He was raised in Bozeman and, like so many other people from the area, loved it so much he never left. Todd has found one of those jobs that aren't work because he gets to do what he loves, which is being outdoors. He is an avid hunter and fly fisherman and hikes for relaxation and exercise. His job allows him to pursue his favorite pastimes, which include designing and building custom knives. On his scouting excursion, he was packing a 10mm pistol and his bear spray because he is a realist and knows that a bear can be anywhere in this area. His handgun is stashed in a chest holster and his bear spray is holstered on his right hip for easy and quick access. He is also very well versed in reading a bear's body language and behavior to ascertain what their state of mind might be. As a precaution to avoid running into a moose or a bear, Todd yelled out, Hey, bear! every few minutes as he climbed the trail into the high country to make sure any nearby animals know he is there. About three miles up the trail, Todd entered a small clearing and noticed on the other side, about 80 yards away, a large grizzly bear, as well as her two little cubs. The cubs were born in the past winter and were probably about nine months old by now, weighing around 20 to 25 pounds. As soon as the sow and cubs saw Todd, they immediately headed in the opposite direction, giving him a false sense of security at the thought of their apparent retreat from a human presence. Little did Todd know the sow had headed her cubs up the hill a bit and ordered them up a tree. Then she circled back toward him. As Todd patiently waited to see where the bears had gone, she bore down on him and closed the distance with stunning speed. As Todd continued up the trail, he briefly looked at the ground as he stepped and suddenly heard a noise above him on the hill. He quickly glanced up and saw the 400-pound furious sow grizzly focused on him, eyes burning with rage. She was hell-bent on taking out what she perceived as a threat to her cubs, and nothing could change her mind. Just to understand a protective mama bear's perspective a bit, let's take a second to discuss why they react the way they do to perceived threats. In the bear world, the greatest threat to those tiny cute bear cubs is a big old grumpy boar who is driven by, let's say, biological urges. Somehow, boars know that if they kill a sow's cubs, she will be brought back into heat, or a state of biological readiness to mate. The boar will get to feed off of the cubs and sometime later get the chance of breeding her. Female bears know this and react to any threat to their cubs, real or imagined, with a near-nuclear display of power and aggression. A sow grizzly has even been filmed sprinting a quarter mile down a steep incline to climb a tree to attack and kill a boar black bear after smelling his scent on the breeze. They do not know mercy or tolerance when it comes to anything that can harm their cubs. Todd began to shout at the sow as soon as he saw her charging toward him. 
Hoping she may have misunderstood what he was, he waved his arms and yelled to show her he was a harmless human and not a threatening boar. Well, Todd didn't get to wave his arms more than just a few times before he realized this sow was not bluff charging. When a bear bluff charges, they tend to bounce and peek at what they are headed toward, as if searching for more information. When a bear is not bluff charging, their eyes are fixed on their target and there is no hesitation in their approach. He quickly reached down to pull out his can of bear spray and flick the trigger guard off in a practiced motion. Bear spray manufacturers recommend discharging the noxious cloud of irritant when the bear is within 25 to 35 feet for optimal effect. Todd estimated that he discharged his bear spray when the sow was 25 feet from him. He watched as the orange cloud billowed from the canister and settled into a hazy layer of hopeful protection between him and the sow, hoping and expecting but really hoping that the bear would get a snoot full of that cloud and decide she didn't want to mess with anything that painful. Todd's hopes were terrifyingly dashed when the sow blurred right through the cloud as if it wasn't there. The bear spray had no immediate effect on the sow and she shoved Todd to the ground. Todd knew he had to protect his neck and head most and curled up into a ball with his hands covering his neck. With his face in the dirt, the bear rapidly and repeatedly bit his left arm several times and bit his back a few times as well. She fortunately took out some of her frustration on his backpack, which prevented even more damage to Todd's vulnerable body. The sow bit into Todd to try to elicit a reaction and waited a few seconds, then bit again in another location on his body. She did this several times over a few minutes before she started coughing in response to the bear spray emitted earlier. She broke off the attack and coughed her way back up the hill and toward her cubs. Now relieved by the departure of the sow and bewildered at how he was still alive, Todd slowly made it back to his feet. His eyes and legs worked fine, even though his arm and shoulder were severely and repeatedly bitten. He knew he had to get off that hill and back to his truck to get to medical help soon, and started jogging back down the trail. After he covered a couple hundred yards, Todd decided he had better check out his injuries. He could see blood seeping from several puncture wounds on his arms and shoulder, but knew these were not life-threatening. He thanked God out loud that they weren't worse as he briskly hiked. The most important thing to him right now was not to bandage his wounds, but to get as far away as he could from that angry sow as quickly as possible. Several minutes down the trail, Todd heard another noise behind him and saw a blur out of the corner of his left eye. About thirty feet from him, the sow had returned and was now charging him again at full speed. The feeling of elation at getting off so easy on the first attack drained from his body as he had no bear spray this time, and the sow was not slowing down as she approached him. Todd again assumed the position he had used earlier to protect his neck and head. He flopped face first into the ground and wrapped his arms around his neck and head in anticipation of the follow-up attack. As she approached him, the sow used his shoulders as a stopping pad as she placed both her paws on them, crushing him into the ground. Her teeth again pierced the flesh of his arms and shoulders with bites Todd described as being hit by a sledgehammer with teeth. As she drove her canines through his forearm, Todd heard his bones pop from the bite pressure. Everything from the point of the bite to his fingertips went numb and limp, flopping uselessly as he struggled to cover himself. As the pain from the bite to his forearm shot through his body, Todd let out a gasp and twitched in response. This was the proof of life the sow needed to re-energize her attack on him. She quickly bit him hard, several times all over his shoulders and upper back. Todd fought the instinct to react to the pain. Each time he gasped or twitched in reaction to the bites, the sow would follow up with several more bites. He tried to lay still as she began to chew on his head, now that his arm was limp and not protecting it. On about her third bite to Todd's head, he felt a flood of warm blood pour over his face. She had opened up a deep gash about five inches long, just above his ear, and partially displaced a small patch of his scalp. The pictures of this wound are gory, to say the least, and would not pass YouTube scrutiny, so I have posted them on my Patreon, which is linked below, along with other pictures from Todd's attack. They are fairly gut-wrenching, so view them at your own risk. They do show you just how thick the scalp tissues are on a human being, which is quite interesting, but yet yeah, definitely not for young people to see. After feeling such a flood of blood flow into his eyes and down his face, Todd was certain the sow was going to finish him off this time. He helplessly awaited a crushing bite to his skull as he resigned to the fact the sow grizzly was going to kill him. Apparently tearing a man limb from limb can be exhausting even for an enormous apex predator. 
The sow suddenly stopped after nearly scalping Todd and pressed her full weight onto his back, crushing the air from his lungs. He knew if he so much as twitched, she might renew her attack, so he laid still, listening to the silence interrupted only by the sounds of the sow breathing heavily and sniffing him. Her warm breath pelted the back of his neck rhythmically as she assessed if Todd was dead and the threat to her cubs ended. Her paws were pressed into his lower back, and he could feel them digging into his flesh as she angrily watched him for any sign of life. The putrid scent of the sow filled Todd's nostrils and made resisting any movement even more difficult. The sow remained positioned this way over Todd for about thirty seconds. As suddenly as she appeared, she disappeared. Undoubtedly, concern for her cubs had changed her focus now that Todd had ceased all movement. She had proven her point to Todd and any boar grizzlies that may have seen her violent intent to protect her cubs. Todd wanted to see where the sow was, but was too afraid to move. His eyes were full of his own blood, which completely obscured any detail in his vision. He knew he wouldn't survive a third round with the angry sow and slowly maneuvered his arm beneath his chest in search of his 10 mm pistol. It was gone. Wiping the blood from his eyes, Todd lifted his head, searching for the solace of knowing the sow had, in fact, finally left him. He searched the ground around him and located his pistol still in its holster only five feet away. During the attack, the sow had cut the binding to his holster, holding it to his chest, allowing it to tumble the short distance. His backpack was mutilated and served as a harbinger of the damage that would have otherwise been done to his back. Todd quickly gathered up his scattered belongings and resumed his descent toward his truck. Blood poured from the gash above his ear and the twenty-five other bites all over his body. He knew he had about forty-five more minutes of hiking before reaching safety and determined that he wasn't about to let himself bleed out without trying to make it. He resumed alternating between brisk hiking and jogging back down the trail. When Todd reached the trailhead he could see another vehicle parked near his own. His mind immediately jumped to the thought of that person also running into the angry sow. He had the wherewithal to pull out his cell phone and immediately record the results of the day's adventure on it as he dripped blood all over the cab of his truck. A short distance down the road, Todd approached a rancher. He waved the rancher down and asked him to call the hospital to let them know he was coming and would need immediate medical care. Just to prove how tough he was, Todd called his girlfriend as soon as he got reception on his cell phone. He calmly asked her how her day was going and asked her if she wouldn't mind bringing him a change of clothes to the hospital. When Todd pulled up to the hospital, he was met by a full medical team as well as a police officer. He asked the officer to open his truck door, put his truck in park, and unfasten his seat belt, since his left arm was numb and useless. The officer was glad to see that through it all, Todd had still remembered to buckle his seat belt. Todd was rushed inside and an assessment was underway to get a good measure of the damage the sow had done to his body. His limp left wrist was x-rayed and it was noted that the bear had chipped his ulna when biting into it, causing the nerves that controlled his wrist and hand to stop working. It took the medical team eight hours to stitch up all of Todd's wounds where his flesh was punctured and torn by the bear's powerful jaws. By morning time, Todd's bruises were a dark palette of green, purple, and blue and covered his entire upper arm, shoulders, and parts of his back. Many of the bruises were due to bites that didn't quite puncture or tear his skin, but nonetheless ruptured blood vessels underneath. Dark bruises in the shape of bear paws had emerged from where the bear stood on his back while waiting for him to move. From being crushed into the ground by the sow, Todd had bruises all over his face and chest as well. In typical tough Montanan fashion, Todd described the day's events as not his best day and expressed gratitude at being alive to share this moment with his loved ones. Madison County Sheriff Roger Thompson urged Todd to buy a lottery ticket, stating that luck had to be on his side to survive two bear attacks on the same day. Sheriff Thompson likened Todd's attack to being struck by lightning twice on the same day. Todd's girlfriend added to the comedy by stating that it looked like he had gutted an elk in the driver's seat of his truck. Todd Orr did everything he was supposed to do, right down to having the discipline and self-control to lay still while being bitten twenty-five times by the angry sow. Todd was grateful that there was no one else with him when he encountered the sow and her cubs. He knew he would do anything to protect his friends, just like that sow had risked her life defending her cubs. Todd is committed to continue hiking and hunting as soon as he has recovered from his injuries. He even went out fly fishing while his left arm was still in a splint, 
In the episode regarding Bram Schaefer's grizzly bear attack, while he was elk hunting with his father, the toughness of folks from Montana was showcased, and Todd Orr's attack reinforces just how tough they are. Regarding the sow and her cubs, there was a brief discussion amongst the officials on what action they should take to address her aggressive behavior. I could find no source indicating that she and her cubs were ever pursued, collared, or killed, and assume she was left alone to raise her babies in peace. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Was it the same bear that attacked Todd twice, or did he run into a second angry grizz? Do you think that Todd deployed his bear spray at the correct distance, or did he deploy it too early? Do you think the bear took it easy on Todd, or was she trying to kill him? Are you surprised the bear attacked him again after being sprayed with bear spray? Do you think the angry grizz followed Todd down the hill to attack him again, or did they simply cross paths again, causing the second attack? Finally, which one do you think would be worse to deal with, an angry sow grizzly protecting her babies, or a tough Montanan who would take a lickin' and keep on tickin'? I will be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the beautiful and rugged mountains of West Virginia, to a ridge called Cheat Mountain. This mountain is one of the highest ridges in the Monongahela National Forest, reaching heights of around 4,800 feet. It is covered with forests of spruce trees and various hardwoods. A century ago, all but a few hundred acres of West Virginia was logged, leaving very little old-growth forest. But what is there is near the Cheat River. The out-of-control logging created patches of what are called second and third growth forests. If you recall in previous videos on our channel, we have talked about forest succession, which starts when the land is cleared through fire, landslide, or logging. The first plants that return are grasses and small bushes, and is considered the first growth. This stage is followed by larger bushes and small trees, which is considered the second growth. It is frequently low visibility and extremely difficult to get through with all of the smaller plants and trees intertwining in competition for resources. As the small trees turn into larger trees over decades, the resource demand and shade they with their canopies shape the pockets of brush and the number of young trees in any given area. At this point in succession, the mature forest has returned and is the most navigable by humans of any other state of forest succession. The impact of such rapid and heavy logging activity devastated wildlife and only recently is the area recovering. Much of the state would now be considered to be second and third growth forest. There are only a few species affected by the excessive logging activity still on the endangered species list including the West Virginia Flying Squirrel and the Cheat Mountain Salamander. Beyond the timber management issues, West Virginia is the only state in the U.S. that has a year-round bear pursuit season. That means that houndsmen can turn their dogs loose on a bear scent trail at any point in the year and chase them until they are treed. After that, they are required to regain control and possession of their hounds, allowing the bear to climb back down the tree and go back to being a bear. On August 2, 2007, half-brothers Phil Propst and Willie Starks rose at 5 a.m. They had been preparing to take their hounds out for a run on a bear scent trail, which was one of their favorite pastimes. They enjoyed it so much that they would take the hounds out a few times a week, some weeks. In West Virginia, bear take season is only a month long in the area where the brothers lived, and the bears here can be 600 pounds on rare occasions. The brothers had a pack of hounds that included a few different breeds. They had red bone hounds, walkers, mountain curs, and black and tans in their hound pack and had painstakingly built their pack over the past several years. The brothers had started their hound pack for hunting raccoons in their childhood, with their father initially. As they got older, they hunted raccoons together, then fell in with a group of houndsmen who pursued bears. They enjoyed the pursuit so much that they eventually gave up killing the bears and focused on the pursuit season only. Phil became so enamored with pursuing the bears that he stopped carrying a firearm with him and clearly didn't carry bear spray. He explained the logic behind this decision by stating that you don't have to kill anything if you get into a spot. You have to figure out a way to get your hounds controlled and removed without shooting and killing the bear. For some reason, that sounds like West Virginia logic, but is definitely beyond my comprehension. 
Phil and Willie loaded up ten of their twelve hounds and made the drive up U.S. Highway 250 toward Cheat Mountain Summit. When they arrived at the turnoff that goes to Godnear Knob Fire Tower, they took their hound with the best nose and chained him to the top of the kennel, mounted in the back of their truck. Their usual practice is to slowly drive down the road allowing the dog on the top of the kennel, called a strike dog, to get a great position to sniff the air as they went. They crept their way down the road and hadn't gone far before one of the hounds bayed out to tell the brothers it had picked up a bear's scent near the road. Phil and Willie got out and pulled two of the dogs from the kennel and let them work to find the trail. Once the two dogs had found the bear's scent trail, the brothers turned out the rest of the pack. The hunt was on. As Phil and Willie listened to the baying hounds racing through the brush, their ruckus told a story of the pursuit. They listened as the hounds crossed the hills and turned back toward the highway they had just left. Looking back down the road, they could see the bear streak across the same road they were on and up the hill in a large circular path as it fled the mayhem of the hounds behind it. The bear was a good-sized bear at what they guessed to be close to 250 pounds but was no 600-pound giant. It should give the hounds a great chase. The size of the bear's head led the men to conclude that it was a male, which meant that it was probably going to run a long way before treeing. Male bears are bigger and tend to attack hounds more often than female bears do, and that isn't exactly the best scenario for houndsmen and their hounds. The brothers listened as the hounds continued to bay and could tell the bear had run right into a part of the ridge crowded with dense second-growth forest full of short trees and bushes that grow closely together creating a hedgerow of tangled plant life. It is very difficult to see through and even more difficult to get through. The trees and bushes on the hillside were so thick and tangled that Phil had a hard time making progress toward his hounds. After much effort, he finally emerged into the spruce section of the forest. He could hear the hounds baying once again and was sure they were barking as if they had treed the bear. As Phil stepped out into a recent clear-cut, he could see two very large boulders towering over everything around them. He could see the bear standing on top of one of the boulders, having found temporary sanctuary from the hounds there. The bear was growling and snarling at the hounds from atop the boulder, but suddenly glanced up toward Phil. As soon as it saw him, it jumped off the boulder in his direction back into the thick brush. The brush completely obscured the exact location of the big bear, but the sounds of a fight between the bear and the hounds filled the air. The sounds were not good sounds. Phil could hear by the yelping and wailing of his hounds that the bear was trying to kill them as opposed to running away. He knew that an angry bear would kill several of his dogs in no time. As Phil got closer, he could see the hounds had pursued the bear into a funnel-shaped rock formation. He couldn't see the hounds or the bear, but read the terrain to discern what was happening. He could hear the hounds yelping and wailing and knew he had to pull them off so that the bear would leave before the hounds were killed. Phil quickly positioned himself in the opening of the funnel and approached from one side, hoping the bear would run out the other side. He could see the bear begin to move toward the opening on the far side of the funnel, and Phil dropped off a rock, pushing his way through to the brush toward his hounds. Phil bent over and stretched out his hand to take control of the first one of his hounds he found. As he glanced up, he could see the furious black bear with its mouth wide open running directly at him. The bear had doubled back, and probably in anger at the hounds, decided that the funnel rock formation that trapped him also trapped Phil and the hounds. Phil was still on all fours, trying to gain control of his hound, when the bear slammed into him and knocked him rolling onto his back. Phil could hear the bear growling and was terrified by the thought of being bitten by it. He raised his hands toward his face to fend off the bear's jaws and screamed as he kicked his legs at the bear in desperate self-defense. The angry bear quickly straddled him and began chewing on his hands as they were extended to push the bear away. Phil could feel the bear's teeth crunching through the flesh and bone of his hands with bites occurring in rapid succession, causing pain to shoot through his body. Time seemed to slow down and lag as is so common in these tense and terrifying situations. Imagine watching the bear's mouth open much slower than it is really happening and crunching through your hand and you will understand what Phil was experiencing. Hearing Phil's screams, his hounds leapt from the boulders landing on top of the bear, who was on top of Phil. This caused the bear to let go of Phil and flee the hounds, who followed in hot pursuit. 
Phil took the break in the attack to roll over to his stomach. He tried to push himself to his feet, but couldn't. His hand simply refused to work. He looked down at his right hand to see the flesh completely torn away and only connected to him by a thin flap of skin. His left hand wouldn't work at all and he could see puncture marks from the bear's canines that penetrated completely through his palm. He knew the teeth must have cut some of the tendons causing the loss of function. His hands now mutilated and non-functional, Phil reached for his two-way radio. He knew he had to get Willie up here to help him get through the tangle of the second growth forest he fought through on his way in, as it would be too difficult by himself. His hands were so mangled that he couldn't work the buttons and dials to get a hold of Willie. The only thing Phil could do was yell, and he did that for about fifteen minutes. Willie piped up and pushed his way through the brush toward his brother. Willie pulled Phil's shirt off and wrapped it around his brother's mangled hands. The men agreed that Phil's injuries were serious but not life-threatening. Willie grabbed his brother's radio and reached out to their friend, Gary Arbogast. He agreed to pick Phil up and take him to the hospital while Willie rounded up the hounds. Phil's injuries were bandaged enough to allow him to push his way back through the tangled brush for a mile and a half back to Highway 250. His hands hurt so much that he couldn't even jog where he was able to. When he emerged from the forest and onto the highway, Arbogast was there waiting for him. They reached out to a police officer, who escorted them to the hospital at Elkins. With the officer's escort, the 40-mile distance was covered in 35 minutes. Once at the hospital, initial examinations of Phil's injuries revealed them to be much more serious than initially believed. After the medical team cleared the injuries and punctures in Phil's flesh from debris, they x-rayed his left wrist. The images revealed that the bones of his wrist and all of the bones composing the palm of his hand were broken. As Phil stood near the nurses, he felt something wet trickling down his right thigh. The nurses investigated to find a bite wound that he must have received while he was kicking at the bear. This wound alone took twelve stitches to close. Phil was laid on a gurney and wheeled into surgery to receive pins in his left wrist and his last two hand bones. While he was under anesthesia, the separated flesh of his right hand was sewn back on. The only repair they couldn't make to his right hand was to fix the nerve to his little finger, which was severed when the bear bit the flesh from the outside portion of his hand. It's likely that he will never again have the use of his little finger on his right hand. Phil Propst is undeterred by the confrontation he had with the big black bear. He couldn't even wait for one week after being discharged before he took his hounds back out and was chasing bears once again. He had a big bandage on his right hand and his left arm was still in a sling, but was happy to be doing what he loved so much. After some reflection on his altercation with the bear, Phil says the attack was his fault. Citing the fact that he crawled into the brush very near to the bear, without an easy escape, he placed himself in an unavoidably hostile and dangerous position. He admits that his dogs had wound the bear up so much that he felt he had to defend himself when he attacked Phil. Phil admits that by climbing into the funnel, he blocked the bear's only way to get out. The only regret he has about his bear attack is that the bear bit so doggone hard. He didn't have to do that part. In West Virginia, Phil Probst's black bear attack was the first recorded bear attack in state history. Given the aggravating circumstances surrounding this attack, I can hardly call it a bear attack. More like a human and dog attack on a bear who defended himself just enough to get away. After reviewing the details surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Do you think West Virginia's year-round black bear pursuit season is why they have never had a bear attack? Do you think that a firearm would have changed the outcome of this attack? Would bear spray have prevented this attack? Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. It will help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.